Hey everybody, today we, we will be talking about the different kind of biological molecules that you can find inside uh, human bodies, animals, and plants. And we'll also be talking about how proteins are made from DNA. Um, you guys will be seeing the different chemistry concepts we covered last week um, in, today's, uh, in today's lecture. So hopefully covering those concepts last week will make today's lecture make a little bit more sense. Um, last week I also talked about uh, carbon. Um, and why carbon is so important in organic molecules found in plants and animals. It has room to make uh, bonds with four different elements, and we will see uh, we will see how carbon can uh, bind or how the ability of carbon to bind four different uh, elements or molecules um, allows it to be so versatile and important in biological molecules. Um, the kind of biological molecules we'll be covering today is carbohydrates, which of course is sugars, lipids, which includes fats and oils, proteins, and then nucleic acids. Uh, you, can find a new, you can find all of those biological molecules in the various kinds of foods we eat. We do make a few of them, but most of those molecules we will get from our diet. Uh, you can find carbohydrates uh, in various foods like pasta, rice, corn, bread, and potatoes. Uh, you can find uh, fats and oils and vegetable oil, butter, lard, ice cream, cheese, and dairy. You can find uh, protein in meats, milk, eggs, various kinds of beans, nuts, and tofu if you're a vegetarian. You can even find uh, various nucleic acids in uh, protein sources as well, like fish and organ meat. So each of these biological molecules are made up of monomers, and each of the monomers are different shapes um, containing those carbon atoms and different molecules or hydrogens. Um, the monomers bind together to form polymers, which of course, just like the name uh, sounds, just means a lot of monomers. These polymers are created by something called the dehydration synthesis reaction. And it's just like it sounds. Um, the monomers are dehydrated and they uh, then bond together to form our polymer. And because our monomers were dehydrated, then uh, we end up, uh, one of our products is water. As you can see here. Here we have our individual monomers like say a single sugar, like glucose. Each of our monomers uh, contain one hydrogen ion and one hydroxide ion. Uh, when they undergo that dehydration synthesis reaction, the uh, hydroxide ion and hydrogen ion bind together to form water molecules. And then that frees up those electrons to be bound to the other electrons on the monomer uh, forming our polymer. So pretty simple, right? If we wanted to break up our polymer and wanted those individual monomers, we would just have to put that water back into the uh, back into it. And we call this hydrolysis. And um, it is, again, just kind of like it sounds, you use water, the Latin root word for water, to lyse or break apart the polymer so we end up with our monomers. So here we have our polymer, and uh, during the hydrolysis reaction, uh, water molecules are used to break the to break the bonds in between the in between the monomers. So the hydrogen and hydroxide ions are then split apart and then added to each side of our monomer. So then our monomers can no longer bind together, and then that just leaves the monomers as independent molecules. So carbohydrates are almost universally used as the immediate energy source in living things. We'll discover this in a couple weeks uh, when we talk about cellular respiration. Um, carbohydrates have many different roles besides just energy uses in both plants and animals. They play structural roles uh, like cellulose that makes up the plant cell walls, walls which we covered a couple weeks ago. Um, glucose is going to be the main, uh, the most common monomer uh, within carbohydrate polymers. And carbohydrates can be either monosaccharides, which is one sugar, disaccharides, which is two sugars, or polysaccharides, which are many sugars. 
Uh, monosaccharides are also known as simple sugars. Um, and uh, they can contain between uh, three to seven carbons in their backbone. Uh, generally, carbons are going to be made up of carbon rings. So they're going to pretty much be shaped as a circle. Um, the, the most common uh, the most common of uh, sugar or monosaccharide is going to be glucose and its chemical formula is C6H12O6 and this is going to be this is going to be the sugar that is going to be used most often as the energy source for cells. Uh, ribose, or ribose and deoxyribose are also common sugars that can be found within the cells. We'll talk about those a little bit later but you can find deoxyribose in DNA and then you can find ribose in RNA. Glucose has a couple of different isomers, and isomers just mean that the sugars contain the same chemical formula, um, just a different structure. So fructose and galactose are isomers of glucose, so they'll contain the chemical structure of C6H12O6, but they'll be shaped in a different way, and so um, that allows them to play different structural roles throughout uh, uh, within a animal or a plant. Disaccharides are when two sugars are bonded together. Um, some examples of disaccharides includes maltose, uh, which is made up of two glucose molecules, and it is used to make, uh, it is used to make beer through a process called fermentation. Sucrose is common table sugar, and it is made up of uh, glucose and fructose. And then lactose is the sugar found in milk, and it is made up of glucose and galactose. Polysaccharides are just really long chains of monosaccharides. Um, they are really long, and um, because they contain so much sugar, they contain a lot of energy. Um, so polymers are going to be used as energy storage in both plants and animals. Plants will store, uh, will store uh, glucose as starch. Um, a polysaccharide, and then animals will store glucose as glycogen, another polysaccharide. Um, like we talked a little, about a little bit earlier, polysaccharides can also be used as, a, uh, can have different structural roles in both plants and animals. Um, we'll find a, a polysaccharide called cellulose within the plant cell walls. And um, we'll find uh, another polysaccharide called chitin within the exoskeletons of crabs, lobsters, and insects. So here you can see the um, chemical structure of starch. Starch just has um, starch is a string of monosaccharides here bonded together, forming that polysaccharide. And so our um, so in this particular uh, with sorry, in this particular example, our monomers are these little glucose molecules here, and then through that dehydration synthesis reaction, it formed this polymer starch. Um, and starch is really important within plants. Um, it acts as a long uh, acts as an energy storage for those plants when they're not able to uh, when they're not able to produce their um, they're, they're not able to produce their own glucose uh, during like uh, whether it's really cold outside or when it's uh, really cloudy outside and there's just no sun. So starch here, um, so potatoes, for example, will use starch during the winter um, for it to continue to grow and develop more leaves and more potatoes um, when, there's, when it's too cold and there's not enough sun outside for it to undergo photosynthesis. So here's the chemical structure for glycogen, and glycogen is what glucose is stored as. Uh, within animals. Within humans, glycogen is going to be stored within the liver and is going to be used to help maintain our blood sugar levels in between meals. A hormone called insulin is going to be released, uh, which then tells our, level, our liver to break down that glycogen and release glucose. So again, just so our blood sugar levels will be stable in between meals or if we just go um, a, long, a long time without eating. So here's the chemical structure for cellulose. And cellulose, again, is just that polysaccharide that is going to be found within the cell walls of, of plants. Um, notice here how the glucose is in cellulose is bonded together differently than in glycogen and starch. 
the way that glucose is bonded together um, eventually makes a very strong fiber that will crisscross on top of each other, um, giving the plant a extra support and structure. Now we'll move on to lipids. And lipids, as you guys know, are going to be hydrophobic or not going to be able to dissolve in water. Um, lipids contain long nonpolar hydrocarbon chains, which pretty much just means it's a really long chain of carbons that have a bunch of hydrogens connected to those carbons. Um, some of the lipids will contain different functional groups that are hydrophilic or water loving and so can be dissolved in water. Um, fats and oils uh, are also used as long term storage within plants and animals. Um, some other uses of oil in the animal world is it is used to waterproof skin, hair, and feathers. One example of a lipid is called a triglyceride, and it's going to be one of the more common lipids found within the human body. Um, and triglycerides are made up of one glycerol molecule and three fatty acids. So here in, uh, within our triglyceride molecule, our monomers are going to be glycerol and each of our three fatty acid tails. In order to form our polymer, um, our monomers will undergo a dehydration synthesis reaction, uh, creating those three water molecules and then our one triglyceride molecule. Notice here, um, these long carbon chains. And these carbon chains are then just uh, bound to a lot of different hydrogens, um, which gives it its name a hydrocarbon chain. So fatty acids are either saturated and unsaturated, and it just depends on how much hydrogen is found in those hydrocarbon chain, or on, in those hydrocarbon backbones. Saturated fats are saturated with hydrogen, uh, which means there, there's just gonna be a lot of hydrogen and no, and no double bonds within that carbon backbone. Um, generally, saturated fats are going to be solid at room temperature because those fatty acid tails are straight and so are able to comfortably lay on top of each other. Unsaturated fats, though, don't have as much hydrogen uh, on that carbon backbone, and so um, they're going to have double bonds in that, uh, within the carbon backbone and create these kinks. And because of that, the fatty acid tails can't lay on top of each other and just kind of create a jumbled mess. And so unsaturated fats are generally going to be uh, liquid at room temperature. So here you can see uh, within our unsaturated fat here, um, there's not going to be as many uh, hydro or as many hydrogens, uh, which are represented by the little white balls here, which frees up more space in our carbon molecule. And so it's going to create this double bond right here in, um, with this other carbon, creating these kinks. And again, those kinks do not allow the fatty acid tails to properly lay on top of each other. And so all of our unsaturated fats will be liquid at room temperature. But saturated fats, on the other hand, um, are just saturated with hydrogen. And so all of, all of the, and so the uh, uh, outer shell of our carbon molecule is full. And so there's no, gonna be no double bonds found within our carbon backbone. Again, allowing those fatty acid tails to properly lay on top of each other um, and then causing our saturated fats to be solid at room temperature. Uh, trans fats though are a little different than unsaturated fats uh, because the hydrogen atoms around the, cover, around the carbon double bond is on the opposite side of the bond. Trans fats and saturated fats are both going to be solid at room temperature. Um, and this means when eaten, these, uh, these aren't good for you uh, because the fatty acids can clump together and can cause plaque within the blood, leading to high blood pressure and heart problems. Generally, trans fats are going to be found in processed foods. Because unsaturated fats are liquid at room temperature, these do not create a plaque in your blood and so it is a lot healthier for you. Um, another type of lipid found within the body are phospholipids. These should sound a little familiar since we covered um, the phospholipid bilayer found within the cell membrane uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, so phospholipids only contain two fatty acid tails and, a, and um, 
and a phosphate head. Our phosphate head is going to be polar, so it's going to be hydrophilic. And then our fatty acid tails are still hydrophobic. So here we have our two fatty acid tails, and we still have our glycerol molecule. But because we don't have that third fatty acid tail, um, this gives us group, uh, this gives us room um, for a phosphate molecule to bind to uh, to our glycerol molecule, allowing us to have some type of polarity in our phospholipid. So the polar head will be facing outward and inward within our the watery matrix of the cytoplasm and on the watery matrix of the of the outside of the cell. And then our nonpolar tails are going to be facing inside, uh, um, facing inside the cell membrane toward each other. Steroids are another type of lipid, although they do not contain fatty acids. However, they are still going to be contained, or they're still considered a lipid because they do not dissolve in water. Uh, steroids still contain a high, um, are still still contain a bunch of carbon, except like uh, like sugars, they're going to be made up of carbon rings, and they are made up of four carbon rings to be to be more specific. Um, all of the steroids in our body are going to be derived from the cholesterol that we eat, um, and they will differ from each other based on different functional groups, like hydroxide or ammonia. Some, uh, some steroids that you can find in our body are uh, the sex hormones, so testosterone and estrogen, and our body is going to make testosterone based on the cholesterol that we eat. Notice how the basic, uh, the basic structure of both cholesterol, testosterone, and estrin, estrogen have those four fused carbon rings. Um, they're just going to differ based off those functional groups. So proteins don't contain as many carbons as our previous molecules. Instead, they contain just one carbon, and then they're bound to uh, four different functional groups. Um, each amino acid will have an amino group, a carboxyl group, um, a hydrogen atom, and then a different R group, which stands for rest. Uh, the 20 different amino acids that our body uses is going to differ just based on that R group. Um, and proteins, uh, proteins have many different roles within the body. I know we covered a couple of them already. Um, they provide, uh, they have different roles in support, metabolism, transport, defense, regulation, and many others. So every gene found within our DNA codes for a different type of protein. And even though your cells all contain the same DNA, what makes them different from each other is the type of genes they express, and so the different types of proteins that they make. Um, the cells found within your hair, skin, and even spider webs uh, produce a protein called keratin, uh, which gives it structural support. Um, a protein called hemoglobin, which is found within your red blood cells, uh, carries, uh, allows the red blood cells to carry oxygen throughout your body. And then two different uh, proteins called actin and myosin um, helps your muscles to move. So here you have our monomer, and our monomer is going to be an amino acid. Um, notice how um, notice how we have one carbon uh, atom here, and it has room to bond with four different groups or four different molecules. Um, each amino acid will have one amino group, uh, one hydrogen atom, one carboxyl group and then one other R group. Um, and each of the amino acids are going to differ just, uh, are gonna differ on that R group. So here valine is gonna have this particular R group. Uh, tryptophan is going to have two carbon rings within its R group. Uh, glutamate is going to have this particular R group. Um, and notice how that R group gives it different chemical properties. Um, the, the R group found within valine is going to make this protein nonpolar. However, the R group found within glutamate is going to make this protein ionized. 
which is going to give it a charge and make it um, and make it hydrophilic and, or make it polar instead of nonpolar. So our monomers uh, in proteins and amino acids are going to bind together to form peptides or polypeptides. Polypeptides are when two or more amino acids are chemically bonded together. And polypeptides are when there's just a lot of amino acids bonded together. And each amino acid is going to be bound together through something called a peptide bond um, through that dehydration synthesis reaction. Um, the, the shape of the protein is going to be determined by the amino acid sequence. And so the amino acid sequence is really, really important um, because, if the, because if the protein isn't shaped properly, then it can't work properly. And so isn't going to be able to fulfill its role in the cell, which can be really, really harmful, as we'll see in a little bit. So here we have our two monomers, our amino acids coming together through that dehydration synthesis reaction, giving us our water molecule and our, um, the start of our peptide, uh, the, start of our, the start of our protein, um, and those two amino acids are bonded together through that peptide bond. So the shape of a protein is going to be its three-dimensional shape and is going to determine its function within the body. Like I was saying earlier, um, if the protein loses its shape or is destroyed, also called denatured, then it can't fulfill its role in the body and can cause some really bad ish health issues or diseases. Um, uh, this is usually caused due to a change in pH or a change in temperature within the body. Um, this is why it's so important for your body to remain in homeostasis so that the proteins can function properly. There are, th there are three main levels of structure for proteins, and some proteins will co contain a fourth structure. So the primary structure is the specific amino acid sequence. The secondary structure is when the amino acids are connected together, forming either helices or pleated sheets. The tertiary structure is going to be when the helices or the pleated sheets uh, bind together. And then the quaternary structure is when there's two or more proteins that are bonded together. So here we have our primary structure and when we have our different sequence of amino acids and each of our amino acids are going to be bounded together through these peptide bonds. Um, the primary structure is probably going to be the most important of any of the other structures because the primary structure or the sequence of amino acids will determine the secondary and the tertiary structure. So if the amino acid sequence is off, it means the protein won't be shaped properly and so can't function in the body. When our secondary structure is, what is going to be when our amino acids are bound together and is going to form these helices shapes or this accordion shaped here, um, also called pleated sheets. Our tertiary structure is when those pleated sheets and those helices uh, bond together, uh, giving it a 3D shape. And like, like I was saying a little earlier, not all proteins is gonna have this fourth or quaternary structure, um, but some do. Uh, one very important example is hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is made up of four different proteins, um, two alpha globins and two beta globulins. Globulins, yeah. Um, if, um, if one of those globulins isn't properly connected in hemoglobin, then it causes, a, it, causes the, it causes hemoglobin to not be able to properly carry around oxygen to, to your organs and your muscles. And so you will, uh, you will end up experiencing fatigue, anemia, and some other really bad symptoms that can um, really be very, very harmful to your health. The last biological molecule we'll cover is nucleic acids. And nucleic acids include both DNA and RNA. Um, DNA stores genetic information, um, and RNA will help make the proteins from DNA. Uh, both of them are pretty similar. Um, they're going to have similar structures. 
um, but there are some significant differences between them. One of them being the sugar that makes up the nucleotide uh, within, D, uh, within DNA and RNA. You're going to find um, deoxyribose, uh, the sugar deoxyribose found within DNA, and you're going to find the sugar ribose found within RNA. Um, each of the nucleotides, though, are going to be made up of that sugar, a phosphate group, and a nitrogen-containing base. In between RNA and DNA, there are five different nitrogen bases. We have adenine, guanine, cytosine, uracil, and thymine. So there is a specific relationship between proteins and nucleic acids. As a sequence of uh, nucleotides found within DNA and RNA will determine the amino acids found within the proteins and so determine the structure of our proteins. If any, if any of those nucleic acids are off, caused by some type of mutation, um, then it will, cause, uh, it will cause a structural problem in the proteins and so cause diseases. Um, one of those diseases being sickle cell disease. And sickle cell disease is only caused by one mutation. Uh, which um, causes one amino acid uh, one amino acid difference between normal red blood cells and sickle red blood cells, and this one little difference causes a whole array of symptoms for the person affected by it. Um, this is a type of uh, genetic disease, and it is an autosomal recessive disease. So within a normal red blood cell. Um, the proper amino acid uh, that should be in the sequence is glutamate, but in someone that has sickle cell disease, um, the, am the amino acid structure um, instead has valine in the place of glutamate. Uh, this substitution makes red blood cells lose their normal round shape and becomes hard and jagged and shaped like a sickle. When these abnormal cells go through small blood vessels, uh, like found in your hands and your feet, they can get clogged and cause some really bad symptoms uh, like pain, organ damage, and anemia. Sickle cell disease, um, if it's not treated, could be fatal. Next, we'll move on to chapter 11, where we'll talk about the specific structure of DNA and how the DNA is transcribed and translated into proteins. Greg Mendel, the father of genetics, didn't know anything about the structure of DNA. For years, investigators argued over whether it was DNA or proteins responsible for the, um, the, responsible for the heredity found between the generation of cells. And so, um, so two scientists, Alfred Hershey and Martha Chase, uh, decided to conduct an experiment. And their experiment, uh, their experiment studied how a virus infected a infected bacteria, and they decided to use the bacteria E. coli. The virus that they used had DNA that was contained inside a capsid, and that capsid was made of protein. Uh, they put radioactive tracers on both the DNA and the capsid, and then they followed uh, they followed the radioactivity to see whether it was the DNA or the capsid that was injected inside the bacteria and so used to reproduce the virus. Um, they saw that it was the DNA that was injected into the bacteria, and so it was DNA that contained the genetic information. So here you can see our bacteria E. coli and our virus uh, that contains the DNA uh, contained within that capsid made of the proteins. Both of them were radioactively traced, shown by the yellow color in this picture here. Um, after the virus was allowed to infect the bacteria, our two scientists were able to figure out that it was the radioactively traced DNA that was injected into the bacterium and therefore used for the virus to reproduce, uh, therefore proving that it is the DNA that contains the genetic information. So the discovery of the structure of DNA had the contribution of several scientists. Erwin Shargoff determined that adenine paired with thymine and cytosine paired with guanine. He was able to figure this out by studying the DNA from uh, many different animal species. He saw the amount of the, the different amounts of our four nitrogen bases and saw that there was an equal amount of adenine and thymine 
in an equal amount of guanine and cytosine, uh, therefore discovering that uh, adenine will always pair with thymine, and thymine will always, or sorry, and guanine will always pair with cytosine. Within the human DNA, there is 31% adenine and thymine, and 19% guanine and cytosine. Here you can see um, the different parts that make up a nucleotide. We have our sugar, um, and our two sugars in our nucleic acids is deoxyribose and ribose. Each nucleotide will have a phosphate group. And then uh, over here you can see our different nitrogen bases that can be found uh, within our nucleotides. Both RNA and DNA will have adenine, guanine, guanine, and cytosine, but only DNA will have thymine, and only RNA will have uracil. Uh, adenine and guanine are both purines made up of two carbon rings. Cytosine, thymine, and uracil are pur pyrimidines, um, just made up of a single carbon ring. Rosalind Franklin used X-ray crystallography to study the structure of DNA. Um, so as shown within this picture here, uh, the center of the X is where the nitrogen bases come together, and then the shadows at both the top part and the lower part shows a repeating pattern. And this showed Rosalind Franklin that DNA has a helical structure. In 1951, Watson and Crick was able to take the discoveries of the previous scientist and put it all together to come up with the final double helical structure of DNA. Um, they were able to extrapolate from the double helical structure of how DNA might be replicated, and they won the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, so DNA is a double helix, or kind of like if you take a ladder and twist it together. The latter rungs are our nitrogen bases that are bonded together. And then the two, uh, the two backbones of the latter is the, sh is the sugars and the phosphate groups bonded together. Uh, the sugars and the phosphates are bonded together through peptide bonds. And our nitrogen bases are connected together through hydrogen bonds. Um, and are the, the nitrogen bases are complementary paired um, adenine will always pair with thymine, and guanine will always pair with cytosine. So here you can see our sugar and phosphate backbone. Um, we have our sugar that is bound with a peptide bond to our phosphate. And then you have our nitrogen bases in the center bound together through that hydrogen bond. Um, just another thing about the structure of DNA is that the two sides are anti-parallel or meaning that they're running in opposite directions of each other. RNA is a little different than DNA. Um, it contains the sugar ribose. It, instead of thymine, it will have the nitrogen base uracil, although it will still contain adenine, cytosine, and guanine. Um, it is single-stranded single instead of double-stranded. And there are three main types of RNA. There's messenger RNA, shortened to mRNA, transfer RNA, shortened to tRNA, and then ribosomal RNA, shortened to rRNA. So here we still have our uh, phosphate and sugar backbone. And then we have our nitrogen bases that are connected to our sugar, except um, notice that the nitrogen bases do not have a complementary pair since it is single-stranded. So I know DNA and RNA can be kind of complicated, so let's compare them so it makes a little bit more sense. Uh, the similarities between DNA and RNA is that they are both nucleic acids. They are both composed of nucleotides. They both have a sugar and phosphate backbone, and they each have four different types of nitrogen bases. Um, however, <clears throat> there are some significant differences between them um, that gives them different uh, roles within the cell. DNA is going to be found in the nucleus and contains our genetic information. Um, its sugar is going to be deoxyribose. Um, its four nitrogen bases are going to be adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. It's going to be double-stranded. And DNA is going to be transcribed, which will make a little bit more sense later. 
RNA is found in both the nucleus and cytoplasm. Uh, RNA is the helper to DNA. Um, its sugar uh, found within the nucleotide is ribose. Its bases are adenine, uracil, cytosine, and guanine. It is gonna be single-stranded. And um, the three different types of RNA are going to have uh, very important uh, very important roles within protein synthesis. synthesis. So we have messenger RNA, which is produced in the nucleus uh, from the DNA template. It, can t it carries the genetic information uh, from the DNA to the ribosome so that proteins can be created. Transfer RNA is going to be responsible for, uh, ta uh, for bringing the specific amino acids to the ribosome so that the proteins can be made. And then the ribosomal RNA is where the protein synthesis is actually gonna happen. You can find uh, ribosomal RNA, uh, both floating about in the cytoplasm or con connected to the rough endoplasmic reticulum. So again, the three types of RNA have different roles um, within protein synthesis. So in the early 20th century, uh, Gerald noticed that members of the same family had the same metabolic disorder. So, um, so he suggested that they might all lack a certain metabolic enzyme. His hypothesis was little, later confirmed uh, when a couple of scientists did an experiment involving mutant red mold, bread mold uh, that was unable to produce a certain uh, particular enzyme. This led them to suggest that there is a link between genes and proteins. So protein synthesis has two different steps. There's transcription, where our DNA will be turned into mRNA. And then there's translation, where that mRNA will be read and uh, turned into our protein. So our first step of protein synthesis is transcription and occurs within the nucleus. Um, and this is when our DNA is turned into mRNA. The mRNA will then move out into the cytoplasm where it will be translated into, a, into our protein. So our genetic code contains the information that each of our cell needs um, to make the specific proteins that it does. Um, each three nucleotides in DNA is called a triplet and um, it will have a complementary codon on the mRNA, which means it's gonna contain the same genetic information. Each codon codes for a specific amino acid, and there is a, uh, there's a total of 64 codons um, that, can, that can be found on messenger RNA. 61 of those codons will code for one of the 20 amino acids, while three of those are, going, are stop codons. There are both start and stop codons that will tell the cell where to start making the mRNA and where to stop making the, the mRNA on the DNA template. So there is a total of 64 codons that can be found on messenger RNA. 61 of those codons code for the 20 amino acids that our bodies use to make up the, our various proteins, uh, which is really good as this provides flexibility within our genetic code in case there is some type of mutation, there's at least a chance that uh, the protein will be made correctly and so be functional in our body. And then the other, the other three codons are stop codons. The first step of protein synthesis is transcription. And this is when the messenger RNA is going to be made from the DNA uh, within the nucleus. First, uh, an enzyme, a protein called RNA polymerase will unwind the DNA um, at the specific gene that it wants to code, encode. Uh, during this time, uh, bases will join together in the order dictated by the sequence of bases on the DNA template strand. So when a cell wants to make a protein, it will look for that specific gene that, that codes for that protein on the DNA, and um, it will then use the RNA polymerase to unwind that DNA. The RNA will know which part of the DNA strand to unwind, um, 
because it will look for something called a promoter region. The RNA polymerase will then unzip the double helix and then connect the complementary RNA bases to the DNA temp uh, uh, based, uh, the complementary RNA bases of the DNA template. It will continue to do this until the mRNA is fully created. However, um, the mRNA isn't quite ready to go out and to go out into the cytoplasm yet. Um, this is because it needs to be processed. Otherwise, uh, different enzymes in the cytoplasm could damage the mRNA. So processing, processing includes uh, removing the introns, adding a cap, and a poly A tail. The introns are part of the DNA sequence that was copied, um, but doesn't code for any amino acids. Only the exons will code for the amino acids. So they wanna, uh, so we only want exons within our mRNA. The cap and poly A tail will protect the mRNA from any damage once it's in the cytoplasm. Once it's finished being processed, the mRNA then moves into the cytoplasm. Um, in certain cases, uh, cells will not remove or will not use all of the exons within a gene, and so a different type of protein is able to be created. Um, as, a re as a result, a gene could potentially code for several different types of proteins. So here we have our DNA that is then transcribed into our mRNA. Again, once our mRNA is uh, created, it, fir it first needs to be processed. And this includes getting rid of all of the introns that do not, con that do not code for any amino acids, um, and then adding our cap and our poly A tail. Um, once our mRNA is fully processed, it can then move into the cytoplasm. As our mRNA moves out into the cytoplasm, um, translation can then begin. And translation just involves the transfer RNA, bringing specific amino acids to the ribosome of, so that the protein can be created. The transfer RNA knows what amino acids to bring based on the codons that are expressed on the messenger RNA because it contains uh, anticodons that match the codons. And just like um, each codon it codes for a specific amino acid, each anticodon also uh, encodes for a specific amino acid. So here is an example of a of a transfer RNA. Each transfer RNA will have an anticodon on one end and then the amino acid on the other end. So during translation, um, the, a codon will be expressed on the messenger RNA, which in this case is CGA. Um, the, an, the matching anticodon on the tRNA is GCU. And the corresponding amino acid is arginine. So the anticodon will uh, will bind to that codon on the mRNA, and the amino acid will be attached to our polypeptide chain. Um, our ribosomes, where protein synthesis actually takes place, is made up of ribosomal RNA and will have two subunits, one large subunit and one small subunit. The mRNA binds to the small subunit, and up to two tRNAs can bind to the large subunit in specific spots. There are three spots uh, on the large subunit for tRNAs to bind to, and these spots are titled E, P, and A. Um, and translation has three different steps to it. There's initiation, elongation, and then termination. Initiation is when is the start of protein synthesis, and it happens when the mRNA binds to the small subunit, um, and the initiator transfer RNA attaches to the messenger RNA, and this complex then joins the large ribosomal unit. Elongation is the formation of the actual protein, so the binding of our amino acids together, and then termination happens when one of the three stop codons are presented. A protein uh, known as a release factor attaches to the stop codon, uh, which tells the ribosome that the protein is now finished. And the ribosome, uh, the two ribosomal units, transfer RNA and mRNA, will all disassociate and can be used in um, and can be used to create another protein. So here we have the beginning of translation. 
Um, translation starts when our mRNA connects to our small uh, our RNA, and our initiator tRNA attaches to that codon, uh, the first codon on our messenger RNA. In this specific example, the transfer RNA is carrying the amino acid methionine. This complex will then attach to the larger ribosomal, sum, ribosomal unit um, to create our entire ribosome. The large ribosomal unit contains three spots, uh, and these spots are given the names E, P, and A. And translation occurs um, from right to left. So the transfer RNA will land in the A spot, move to this P spot, and then leave from the E spot. So our transfer RNA with the amino acids will be in the P spot, which leaves the A spot open for a new transfer RNA. So during elongation, the next tRNA molecule lands in that A spot. Uh, the amino acids join together. Uh, the first tRNA then enters the E spot and then leaves the ribosome. The second tRNA now contains the peptide chain. Uh, the next tRNA with the third amino acid will land in the A spot. The amino acids will join together. The second transfer RNA moves into the E spot and leaves the ribosome. Then we have the third tRNA, which moves into the P spot, opening up the A spot for the fourth tRNA. This keeps happening until our poly polypeptide chain is done. The ribosome knows when the protein is done being created when a stop codon is presented on the mRNA. Uh, an enzyme called release factor will bind to that site, which causes the tRNA to disassociate from that P spot, releasing the protein to uh, its next step, um, probably within the rough endoplasmic reticulum where it can be further modified. Um, when this is done, uh, the the mRNA and the two ribosome, ribosomal units will then disassociate where they could be, uh, they, where the cell can use them um, in a new, uh, to create a new protein. So here we have the entire process of protein synthesis. We have, we have transcription that occurs within the nucleus, and this is when DNA is unwound at the specific part that contains the gene that will encode for the protein that the cell wants to make. We have our messenger RNA that is created from that part on the DNA. Our mRNA is in process and will then move out into the cytoplasm where translation can then begin. Our two ribosomal subunits will connect to our mRNA and our transfer RNAs will bring the appropriate amino acids um, so that those amino acids can be joined together to create, uh, to create our proteins. When that, once that protein is all done being created, our, ribosomal, our ribosome will disassociate where it can be used again. Um, the cell is able to produce a lot of the same proteins at once, and it can do this by translating the same mRNA. So, we'll, so it will have uh, different ribosomes uh, along the mRNA going at it at the same time, thus producing, uh, thus producing many proteins from the same mRNA at the same time. And this forms a complex called a polyribosome.